Um, most years I don't put the major scene out until Christmas Eve. I, I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a ornery about it or anything, but I'm actually kind of insistent that we don't put baby major in the baby, baby Jesus in the manger. Excuse me, baby Jesus in the manger until Christmas Eve. And uh, this year we are going to be reading the pieces of the Nativity scriptures over the course of several Sundays. So we're going to go ahead and put baby Jesus in the manger on the altar. But I want us very clearly understood that there's nothing specific about December 24th at midnight that makes it the time that Jesus is alive and now it's okay to remember that Jesus was born. Uh, there's no time during the year where you should not always have uh, Jesus born in a manger in your heart somewhere, which would give delight to my husband who wants it to be Christmas all year. <laughs> Just as there's no time during the year where you should not have uh, remembrance of Jesus on the cross or remembrance of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father. There's no time during the year where we should not remember that Jesus is alive and that Jesus was born and that in through Jesus, uh, God walked with us, Emmanuel, God with us, and that because of that, we have something that we, we cannot have any other way. And that thing that we have is peace. So let's talk for a minute about peace. You know, we sing it in a song, don't we? We sing, um, uh, Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round young virgin, mother and child. And, and the end of that verse is what? Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. And it evokes this image of a night where nobody's crying, there's no screaming, the animals are all behaving and being really quiet. It's quiet, it's, it's peaceful in our, in our imagination during that song. And so for that reason, I think we might mistake what is happening in the manger as, as quiet. Any parent who screams, I want some peace in this house. It's not really looking for peace. They're looking for quiet. You know, when we talk about peace, a lot of times we, we have the wrong idea what it is that we're talking about. Especially when we're talking about heavenly peace. So I want us to talk for a minute about peace. Peace is disruptive. Peace stops things from happening. Peace ends things. Peace gets in the way of things. Peace is not... The quieting of things. Peace is what stops them from happening. When we talk about peace in the Middle East, it's not peace that we're really talking about. Because when we imagine conflict in the Middle East, when we, we imagine all of the noise and the vitriol and the explosions going off and the violence and all that, and we say we're going to find a way to call for peace, what we really mean is we're going to call for quiet. We're going to call for the bombs to stop, for the shouting to stop, because it's too much for us to hope for peace. So let's talk about what peace actually is. In order to achieve peace, what you have to do is come to a place where the conflict no longer is. Come to a, a place where the, the fear no longer exists. And in order for that to happen, everybody in the Middle East would suddenly have to develop a clear understanding of the hearts of the people on the other side, a desire for them to live a full and, and happy life while also living a full and happy life, a sympathy, a, a grace, uh, a patience and understanding, a gentleness, a generosity, a kindness. Where do those things come from? Fruits of the Spirit. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. Right. For real peace to happen in the middle of a conflict like that, what would have to happen is that all of the graces of heaven would have to descend on the hearts of everyone involved. And we are not foolish enough to think that we can somehow bring that about. So when we say we're talking about peace talks in the Middle East, what we're really talking about is quiet in the Middle East. When parents stand there and go, I want some peace in this house, what they actually mean is, I don't care if you're still mad at your sibling. Stop yelling at them and leave me out of it. Or I will break that toy in half and neither of you will have it. Nowhere in that equation is there peace. Just quiet. So when we think about the baby in the manger, sleeping in heavenly peace, all is calm, all is bright, we imagine a quiet. But that's not what Jesus came to do. Quiet was not what Jesus was here for. Jesus was here for peace. And peace disrupts. We walk around in a fog 
of noise all the time. We walk around with the noises in our hearts, the noise of fear, the noise of pain, the noise of anger, the noise of bitterness, the noise of grief, of loss, of hurt. These things we walk around with in our hearts, and every once in a while we pray to God for peace. And we say, Lord, just looking for your peace here. And what we say, what we mean when we say that is, Lord, just quiet my heart. All right, I, I, I'm, I'm angry at my sister. She and I have fought. We are upset with each other. But I, Lord, I'm praying for your peace. What I really mean is, let me stop thinking about it for a minute. Let me have some quiet. Because if I really wanted peace, then God would enter my heart and say, all right, let's take a look at this from your sister's point of view so that you can understand what it is that your sister was feeling and so that you can have that patience and kindness and compassion and generosity towards your sister. And that way, it will be resolved and the noise will actually stop and you will actually have peace. It's disrupted. God, I'm, pray I'm praying for peace, means God come in and interrupt my whole self-pitying world and stop all of the noise of my own uh, my own soapbox monologue that I've got going on in my head and instead impose on me an understanding of the person that I'm monologuing against so that the pain can actually end. When we are suffering with anger or bitterness and we pray for peace, that's how God offers us and instead what we're asking for is quiet. But Jesus came to bring us peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And in order for Jesus to bring us peace, every single one of us is going to have to allow Jesus to disrupt the noise inside of our hearts. And in order to do that, we have to open ourselves to those gifts of the Spirit. It was always going to be disrupted. Jesus' work, his work of bringing heavenly peace, of making earth as it is in heaven, was always going to be disrupted. And he tells other people that as an adult, too. He, he, he tells his disciples, I was here as a stumbling block. I am here to be a stumbling block. I am here to... He, 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 I, his teachings were going to turn you know, parents against children and brother against brother because it was going to disrupt the noise in which they had made themselves comfortable. This is true whether the noise we're talking about is bitterness or anger or fear. We live in an endless, circling <laughs> cloud of the noise of fear, don't we? Right now, it, it seems stronger for some reason this year, but has it ever really not been true? Have we ever not been completely surrounded by things we were afraid of? Have we never, ever had a time when we didn't have people telling us in media and, and, and our neighbors and friends saying, we need to be worried because this is happening, because this is coming, because these people are doing this and these people are doing that. That noise has always surrounded us. And we have prayed for peace, meaning quiet. We have prayed for things to be quiet. And God has imposed peace instead by bringing us this message of do not be afraid. Do not be afraid for I am with you is a message to Jesus delivers. And if we believe that, then the peace that we're seeking is to walk with Christ. We want to go to where the fear is not. That means walking with Christ. And if we're going to follow Christ, that means following the directions that Christ gives us, which means setting down all of those, those things that make us feel safe, the way the original disciples did. It's disruptive. His peace disrupts. But I think this year, more than anything else, the place that that, that peace disrupts is in our grief. He disrupts our grief. Now, this time of year is incredibly difficult for people who have lost family. All the memories of how you used to spend that time together come back. All of the memories of the things you used to share come back, and they come back in a, in a swirl of noise that makes it so that you can't look at the light of the candle and think peaceful thoughts. You look at the light of the candle and you remember a candle being lit somewhere else, a candle uh, being part of, of another picture or a gift under a tree or a Christmas lights, you know, somebody hanging them and all these, these noise, this noise comes back and we pray, Lord, I just want to have peace. I just want to have a good Christmas. Just give me peace about this loss. And what we really mean is, Lord, just let me stop thinking about it for a minute. 
But God disrupts that. He turns our grief into something else to give us peace. He gives us certainty that he has been victorious over death. He gives us certainty that he has risen and that therefore we also have risen and that therefore those we love have risen and that through that we can have actual peace in the place of quiet. We can actually look at these things and think, we'll celebrate again. A disruption of all of that noise. Instead of going over time and setting aside that grief in a state of quiet, Jesus conquers death so that we can have peace. So that we can have peace in our grief. So, when we sing the words, sleep in heavenly peace, I want us to, from now and, 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 you know, the season's not over, and that's a song you're going to hear playing in the background of stores, and it's going to come on the radio, and probably we'll sing it, you know, as a carol here and there. Remember that there's something profound that is happening in that phrase. There was a song, uh, I'm going to just relate to you a memory. You know, army dependent rat, army rat kids, we're stupid. I just, you know, I don't mean any disrespect, but we have a wonderful ignorance about our situation as military dependents. We don't understand what our fathers are doing, our mothers in some cases. We don't understand what we're a part of as, as military children. So I have a lot of memories of my childhood that are very fun and joyful, in which my mother is crying, and I never really understood why. I'm not sure they know that because I'm a pastor that nothing is sacred as far as stories about my childhood and about them. But I want to share this moment with you. In the midst of an unexpected move, where uh, all of our, where my father's orders had been changed because he injured his knee, and my mother had had to go and uh, establish a home in another place in in, in another uh, town, and that he had moved in with us, we weren't sure what was going to happen next. My parents discovered a song, an album by one of the favorite author, by one of the favorite artists, Michael W. Smith. Are y'all familiar? Y'all have heard of Michael W. Smith, maybe? Some of you. Yeah. He came out with a Christmas album in the late 80s that my mother discovered. And she put the album on, and she began to listen to it, and she began to cry. And as a stupid, stupid kid, I did not understand why my mother's crying. It was a pretty song. So I'm a little, my voice is not great today. Um, it's a little raspy, but I'm just going to sing a little bit of it for you. Are you ready? <laughs> Brace yourselves. All is well, all is well. Angels and men rejoice. Christ has come. she needed to hear. Whatever else was happening, she didn't have solutions for all the problems she was facing. She knew that there were still struggles coming. She knew that she was going to be called on to, to do things. She was worried about my father who would be called on to do things. She was worried about her children and their lives ever finding any kind of you know stability and simplicity. She was worried, but in that moment, it was all already taken care of because Jesus had disrupted it with his birth, with his peace. And because of that birth, all is well. Now for us grammar people, I'm going to say the other more derogatory term for that, that's a tough thing. Jesus was born and all is well. But that is absolutely how this works. Jesus was born, 
His peace has disrupted all of our pain, all of our fear, all of our grief, all of our anger, all of our bitterness, all of our hatred, and will continue to disrupt it. Because Jesus lives in heavenly peace. Amen? Amen. Amen.